Oasis Audio presents Believers, Thinkers, and Founders by Kevin Seamus Hassan. Read for you by John McLean. Part 1 Chapter 1 New Dow's Conundrum How can they get away with it? Public school teachers couldn't lead their classes in pledging allegiance to one nation under Jesus, could they? So how can they get away with one nation under God? That was the essence of atheist activist Michael Newdow's famous challenge to the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance as he was representing himself before the Supreme Court of the United States. He was adamant about it. When asked by Justice Stephen Breyer what if the phrase under God were read very broadly, almost symbolically, Newdow said it wouldn't matter. I don't think that I can read under God to mean no God, which is exactly what I think. And if the meaning of the phrase under God couldn't be stretched as far as dogmatic atheism, then it wasn't nearly elastic enough to be constitutional in Newdow's book. So, no one nation under Jesus, no one nation under God. Period. It was an extraordinary moment, even by Supreme Court standards. Here was a litigant claiming the constitutional right to forbid public school children from invoking the traditional source of all of their, and our, natural rights. What's more, his argument had a certain logic to it, albeit in an appalling sort of way. If you couldn't say one nation under Jesus, just how could you say one nation under God? Call it New Dow's Conundrum. America's traditional theory of rights is an elegant one. The government must respect our rights because they come to us from a source prior to, and higher than, it. Compare our theory of rights to that of Magna Carta. Signed at Runnymede by King John of England in 1215, Magna Carta was a landmark document drafted by feudal barons to limit the king's powers. Magna Carta states in part that, we grant to God that the English church is to be free and to have all of its rights fully and its liberties entirely. Grant to God? Hilarious. In Magna Carta, the king actually purports to grant rights to God. By contrast, the Declaration of Independence insists that rights enforceable against the king are given by God to each individual. As the Declaration puts it, our rights are endowed to us by no one less than the Creator Himself, so no merely human power may legitimately deprive us of them. If all goes well, the state can and should secure our rights in law, secure the blessings of liberty, as the preamble to the Constitution says. If things go wrong, the state can, and too often does, violate our rights. But that's the worst it can do. It can't actually amend or nullify the rights themselves. They didn't come from the state in the first place, so the state can't take them away. They come from the Creator, which is why they're inalienable, so the theory goes. In the tradition of James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, we are a nation with liberty and justice for all, because we are a nation under God. Michael Newdow, though, begged to differ. He wanted his daughter and all public school children to pledge their allegiance only to a very different sort of nation. That nation, as envisioned by Newdow, would also offer liberty and justice for all, but it could do so only because it would not be under God. Otherwise, in his view, it wouldn't be offering liberty and justice for atheists. The secularist challenge to the American tradition has thus finally reached its logical extreme. America, one nation under nobody. Popular outrage continued to erupt. Ever since a lower court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco, had struck down under God in the case almost two years before, an assortment of voices had vied with one another to see who could pour the most scorn on that court's opinion. The bases for the criticisms varied widely, and some were more coherent than others. The most strident gave short shrift to Newdow's conundrum. In fact, they flatly denied its premise. To hear them tell it, America was, always had been, and must always be, a formally Christian country. 
For them, the term under God in the pledge, like the terms creator and nature's God in the Declaration of Independence before it, could properly be understood only as shorthand for the blessed trinity. Only the living God was potent enough to truly endow us with rights, and as Christians, they firmly believed that the living God had revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what else could the Declaration and Pledge possibly mean? They concluded it was absolutely essential to have public school kids begin their school days invoking the Blessed Trinity. And if being able to pledge allegiance to one nation under Jesus was what it would take to ensure that, well then, so be it. Watching this spectacle play itself out, many observers groaned almost in chorus, Here we go again. It's understandable. We've long become numb to annual fights over nativity scenes and menorahs, and we barely even notice the now year-round arguments over public school plays, Halloween parties, Easter egg hunts, and so forth. So when confronted with yet another installment in a seemingly endless saga, we tend simply to roll our eyes, change the channel, and do our best to ignore it. But this one is different. The fight over the Pledge of Allegiance isolates the essential legal and philosophical debate of the culture war and then takes it to its logical extreme. It sets up a supposed dilemma that pits our constitutional rights against the underlying idea of natural rights in the first place. So despite the all-too-familiar cast reprising their well-worn lines, this episode really is worth watching. This time, a great deal is at stake. Of Pilgrims and Park Rangers The players certainly are familiar. In fact, we've seen them over and over again. Broadly speaking, the day-in, day-out dramas over religion and public culture feature the extras of two troops of veteran ideologues. One persuasion, which I dubbed the Pilgrims in my previous book, The Right to be Wrong, are like the fine but fundamentally confused folk of Plymouth Colony who would permit only their own faith to be practiced publicly. Modern-day pilgrims, like their namesakes, undervalue the inherent dignity of even a mistaken conscience, and so they continue to insist that only their true faith belongs in public life. Pilgrims can be found in many faith traditions. Some are dangerous, would-be shoe-bomber types who must be opposed at all costs. The vast majority, however, are very far from it. Nevertheless, their blundering about can still cause real harm. They make the same big conceptual mistake as do their more hardcore colleagues. They think the truths they hold trump other people's freedom. <laughs>